Well, good morning, Genesis community, and happy Mother's Day to all of our incredible, uh, courageous, self-sacrificing uh, mothers in the community. This past year, I became a mother myself, and I have to say that nothing makes you more grateful for your own parents than having a child. Uh, my husband and I, I remember a few weeks into our son's life, lay in bed thinking, because we're both second kids, that, oh my gosh, our parents did this all over again to have us. It's pretty wild. Uh, so even if you think that this is a kind of hallmark cheesy holiday, I hope that today you take the opportunity to honor and love on the women in your life who have mothered you, whether that be biological or adoptive. Uh, they are incredible representatives. Representatives, I think of the character of God. So we honor you today and in light of that we're gonna mix things up a little bit. Uh, we've been in the book of Mark and for today we're gonna kind of pause in that series mainly because the chapter for today felt a little bit odd in light of um, what we're celebrating in light of where we're at and we're gonna do something a little bit different now I'm not gonna necessarily teach a Mother's Day message but when I was asked to speak I thought about really what the last few months have been uh, what God's been teaching me what uh, the process of learning has been in a season of transition and I thought for so many of us I thought of the people who got married this year or were getting married. I thought about the fluctuation of our, our jobs, our um, college situations, our workplaces, our families. And I thought, you know what? So many of us have been in a place of transition. And so why not um, take us to a psalm that really has grounded me and, um, and taught me so much in this? So with that being said, let's open up to Psalms 1. I found myself here in Psalms 1 a few months ago, and really I haven't moved on. Um, I felt, I feel like God has been teaching me so much as I have every morning kind of come back to these six verses. Um, but before I get into too much, let's read it together. Psalms 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in this judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There is so much I would love to unpack here, but for today, I really want to focus on this single truth that I think holds the entire chapter together, and that is the way. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Psalms 1 is not only a, a setup of the book as a whole, but very much a setup for our response and our approach to spirituality. Everything about Psalms 1 is direction orientated. Um, it's it, the language, it, it's positional. And throughout the chapter, there is a constant focus on what, for lack of a better term, I call spiritual geography. So look at the language, walk in the council, stand in the way, sit in the seat, planted by streams, blown by the wind. And all of these positional ideas culminate in the final verse with this kind of distinctive divergent paths, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Two ways, one protected by the Lord and one that will perish. Now there are a few different types of ways in the Bible. This one specifically is most commonly used actually throughout the entirety of scripture and uh, it really refers to the way in which a person moves themselves forward. The decisions they make, the counsel they believe, these initiate a forward motion, a trajectory for our lives. And that trajectory, right, that forward motion is the way for each and every one of us. Now, what I want to say is that this way, right, this trajectory is not 
determined by our background, our family of origin, our education, our gender, our socioeconomic status. It is not about the kind of proverbial uh, deck of cards or hand of cards, I think the phrases that we've been dealt. It's rather about the habits and attitudes we develop along that way. And so although it's connected to where we come from, it is not determined by where we come from. So example of this, you know, if you had to take piano lessons as a kid, it doesn't mean that you know how to play the piano now, right? Or I come from a family that is remarkable in my opinion my parents have been married almost 40 years but just because that's where i come from doesn't mean that's where i'll end up their marriage doesn't determine mine does that make sense and so the psalmist is writing about specifically our choices our habits the things we give our time to the things we don't give our time to the people we see the shows we watch the allocation of our resources our money our time these are the aspects of our life that determine our way, our path. And so given all of these small little details, these decisions that he is pointing us towards, I want you to pause for a moment and I want you to think about yesterday or Friday or this, let's just say the entire week that we've just had, okay? And I wanna think about how did you spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Think about everything you chose to do or not to do. Did you wake up early to spend time with Jesus or not? Did you uh, spend time loving on a spouse or a child or a family member? Who did you get to see? Maybe it was over Zoom on a conference call with the people at your office. What shows did you watch? How much did you watch? What did you read or listen to? What conversations did you have? This week, my husband and I had a fight and spent all of Saturday kind of reconnecting and processing that. That is the reality of some of our week. That's what it looks like. Now, when we stand back and we take into account that week as it stands, the psalmist is talking about the trajectory of what that week would mean in the span of our life. You see, that's why righteousness is a pathway. It is the things that we do along the way. We have to choose it every single day. Years ago, I read uh, some of Augustine, St. Augustine, and one of the things that has never left me is his idea of really how good and evil work in our lives. Now, I am going to do the layman's version of Augustine, but essentially, goodness sits over here. Perfect goodness is our creator. He is the substance of all that is meant to be. He is immutably good. He is perfect in every way. On the other side of the spectrum is evil. And in Augustine's word, complete evil is nothingness because you cannot exist and not have something of the good in you. And the way that he processes our lives, our decisions, the, the, the pathway of righteousness or wickedness is that we are either making our way towards the perfection of God, towards that which he intended for us, towards the image-bearing likeness that he, we see in Genesis 1, that kind of substantial goodness, or we are slowly and systematically being unmade by evil. Does that make sense? We are, we are slowly and systematically moving away from perfect goodness, perfect somethingness, into nothingness. And that is this kind of idea of, of goodness, of righteousness and wickedness. Let's unpack what the scripture says a little bit more. Now, I find it really interesting that the psalmist begins by saying, uh, blessed is the man who chooses not Firstly, okay, it, it not to walk or sit or dwell or participate in anything that is wicked, evil, essentially not of God, not in accordance with the nature and the character of God. And I think this is incredibly important that he starts here because, friends, the way of righteousness begins with letting go. It begins with relinquishing the realities of evil. Now, these terms, wickedness, evil, okay, they, they feel very 
almost mythic. Uh, they can be kind of nebulous, kind of elusive, you know, like the Wicked Witch. I don't know. It, it, the connotations to me are not something that I immediately relate to in my kind of modern vernacular. But the reality is that all around us is a secular narrative that populates almost every aspect of my, of your daily life. So every time we see a sexualized image where the sacredness of the, the human body is being used as a commodity, that is the counsel of the wicked. Every commercial that promotes excess and greed and, and success as something that's this kind of power hungry, money driven reality, that is counter the way of God. That is sitting in the counsel of the wicked. Every TV show that glorifies the decay of marriage, the, the dysfunction of relationships, the distortion of happiness and faithfulness, friends, that is a narrative, is a, is a path that is counter to the righteousness of God. And so every time we entertain those things, every time we place ourselves in a situation where we are being counseled by a narrative other than that of God, that is what it looks like to sit in the seat of, to walk in the way of, to dwell in um, the counsel of, of, of wickedness, essentially. So it doesn't look like maybe what we think. It doesn't look like the kind of temples of old. I think more often than not in our day and age, it looks like South Coast Plaza. Um, kidding, sort of. <laughs> but that's that's how I see it. It's, it's, it's the reality of the world that is separate from the reality of God. And I think we begin our walk towards righteousness by first and foremost walking in the counsel of the wicked refers to the way that we think it's our minds what are my thoughts about what do i allow to filter into my my daily mental state then secondly standing in the way of sinners is about our actions it refers to our behaviors it refers to the way we act or react to the people in our life and then finally stand uh Oh, sorry, sit in the seat of mockers is about our identity. You see, in Jewish culture, where you sat, whether at a table, in the temple, in the family home, was very much a, an identity thing. So men and women, uh, young and old, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile, they were separated by the things that identified them. And that is what the psalmist is getting at. But the way of righteousness, friends, requires us to walk away from a, a ungodly posture of mind, action, and identity, and, and in delight in, meditate on, and plant ourselves by, rooted deeply in his truth. We cannot hold both things and expect to move forward. We cannot position ourselves in the counsel of ungodliness and expect to live out righteousness. And so it begins with turning away from evil, but ultimately the beauty of what the psalmist is saying is that it's about pursuing the good. The way of righteousness begins by not being greedy, but ultimately it's about generosity. It begins by not being selfish, but ultimately it's about laying our lives down um, for the benefit of others. It begins with purity and abstinence, but ultimately it's about enjoying sex within the covenant of marriage. It begins with suspending judgment, but ultimately righteousness is about love and patience and kindness and forgiveness. That is the way that we are being directed towards. You know, um, becoming a parent this past year has been so beautiful and so sobering at the same time. It reminds me a little bit of kind of early years of marriage because you have a perception of yourself of, of how great you are, let's be honest. And then so suddenly something shifts in your life and you're forced in many ways to confront your, uh, your weaknesses, the ways in which you have adopted narratives that are not of God. And, um, oh, sorry. And I, I think I've realized over the years and I'm by no means, you know, like this old person. Um, but, but 
when I was young, I tended to believe that happiness or blessedness is the word the Psalms use was kind of inevitable. I thought, you know, you meet the right person, you kind of get married and all the things you used to worry about are, are not there anymore. You figure out what your calling is and then you find the perfect job that matches that kind of divine calling. And along the way, you become better, kinder, uh, more faithful, kind of you, you grow wise with age. And as I get older, I begin to realize that almost nothing just happens. And I say that without any cynicism. I'm a pretty positive person, but I think experience teaches us, experience has taught me, that marrying the right person doesn't necessarily mean you will have a great marriage. It, it, it's not this magical thing that just happens that having a baby doesn't prepare you for motherhood or fatherhood, that, that graduating from college doesn't necessarily procure you that perfect job, that believing in God doesn't necessitate that you will be like him. James 2 actually says even the demons believe in him. It was in the working out of our faith, he continues. It is in the deeds, the things that we do, the way in which our actions embody the reality of God, that we see that that way of righteousness begin to work itself out. Righteousness, friends, it requires action. It requires diligence. All good things do. And what the psalmist is saying is that in order to yield fruit in season, you have to be planted by the streams of water. In order to yield fruit in season, you have to do lots of work during the winter months so that when harvest comes, you are positioned in such a way that you are bearing fruit, that your leaves are green, that you are living out the reality of the hard work of righteousness that you have committed yourselves to. If I want to be fully satisfied, satisfied in marriage, I think you learn satisfaction in singleness. If you want to be content in all things, you learn that in a job that you hate or when you're unemployed. I think if you if you want to be generous, it starts when you have almost nothing. If you want to be happy, the psalmist says, if you want to be blessed, if you want your life to be filled with righteousness, then you allow yourself to be planted planted in the truth of God. Look at the imagery here. It says the wicked are like chaff that the wind just blows away, but the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water. Wickedness is, is depicted here as something with no substance. It's just kind of blown away. I imagine a tumbleweed, because chaff is not something we are very familiar with, but a tumbleweed, right? It just kind of is blown away. Now, righteousness, as depicted here, is something that is rooted. It is bound by the soil in which it finds itself. I, I imagine kind of roots that go deep, a, a system that can supply a tree that bears fruit tumbleweed, oak tree, or apple tree, or something that is big and strong and, and, and prosperous, if you will. You know what's interesting about these two images is that the modern idea of happiness, um, it, it really, when it comes down to it, um, is about freedom of choice. I think that's what we see the most prolific kind of narrative. Last year, I read um, The Coddling of the American Mind and Why Liberalism Failed and um, there's another book anyways, but, but secular kind of commentators who all sort of draw the conclusion that there is this predominant narrative that happiness is is liberation, is freedom from any kind of constraints. Now they go on to say that they see the decay of society through that kind of freedom. But I thought, you know, a tumbleweed has immense freedom. It can go anywhere it likes. It can be blown in any direction, but it doesn't bear fruit. It can't. It has no connection to the thing which brings it, its, it life. Because fundamentally, restraint 
being grounded, being rooted is the thing that allows us to flourish. C.S. Lewis, he compared this idea to a fish that um, decides it wants to be free by escaping the confines of water. And so it flops out of the ocean. Now, yes, it is free in that moment from the confines of water, but is it happy? No, obviously, right? Because a fish is made for water. And it's kind of a silly, I don't know, analogy, but it's also pretty powerful because you and I are not made to be tumbleweeds. We're not made to be blown about by the wind. We are made for God. We are made to be deeply planted and rooted in him. Now, I wanted to say one thing about this is that part of our kind of cultural narrative is really centered on the idea of feelings. If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad, right? The kind of anthem, Sheryl Crow, I love that song. Maybe some of you are too young for that. But I think it sort of epitomizes the the idea of modernity. If it, If I feel good, it can't be wrong. If I feel like it's it's the right thing, it can't be wrong. But in the words of Dallas Willard, feelings make excellent servants, but terrible masters. Friends, we live in an environment where the, the, the counsel of our day and age is do what feels good. And I think it is a it is the disaster of the modern society. It allows us to, to operate in spaces that, that change the reality. So I feel depressed, therefore my marriage isn't working out. And so we allow ourselves, I think, to escape this, to escape the path of righteousness that requires hard work, that requires diligence, because it somehow seems inauthentic to the thing that we feel. You know, there are many moments when my child wakes up in the middle of the night and I don't feel like getting him. I don't feel like feeding him. I don't feel like having to rock him. But I think anyone out there would say, it doesn't matter. You get up and you tend your child because that is what it means to be a mother. That is what my position requires of me. It's the same thing in marriage. You don't always feel like loving your spouse. You don't always feel like offering up your life in the way that um, Hebrews speaks about. And yet, as a wife who submits themselves, or a husband who submits themselves to the truth of God, that is what is required of me even when I don't feel like it. And can I just say, friends, that if we want to be a people who delight in and meditate on and give ourselves to the way of righteousness, sometimes it is going to feel hard. Sometimes it is going to feel long. In the words of Eugene Peterson, uh, I think he says, uh, our, our faith is a long obedience in the same direction. That to me is the most perfect definition for the ray, way of righteousness. And so we choose to die daily. Sometimes it feels good, sometimes it doesn't. We choose to sacrifice, we choose to abstain, we choose to forego, we choose to pick up, we choose to bear the burdens of one another, to give, to love, to meditate on scripture. Um, and slowly, our way becomes the way, becomes the way of righteousness. And once we find it, we, we bind ourselves to it. We, we plant our roots deep in the soil and our minds and our actions and our identities become so interconnected with what we see here that we slowly begin to look like and reflect and embody the reality of God. It is constant and it is beautiful. This, friends, is what faith is is about. Honestly, these past few months have been a process of learning that it is a long journey, but it's provided me with deep opportunities to confront my own selfishness, my own pride, my own, uh, I don't know, all sorts of things <laughs> have come about. And I am slowly learning that righteousness is possible, but it is not inevitable. 
The path is laid out for me. God is calling me towards it, but I can choose to take my mind and my actions and my identity and commit them to holiness, or I can choose to slowly be, be swept over, be, be overtaken, if you will, be, be unmade by, by something other than what is of God. We are in a revolutionary time of transition. Like I said in the beginning, there are many in our community who are getting married this year, having babies this year, um, many who are uh, graduating, who are going on to new jobs or who have lost jobs, who are living in, I mean, just practically in a different state of life. And transition often affords us friends with a unique opportunity to reorient ourselves. And so I want to end by inviting you into a posture of examination. Tyler's going to lead us in some worship now. Um, and kind of before we get into the singing portion of that, I want you to pause for a moment. If you have a notebook, if you have a, a piece of paper, if you have an iPhone, if you are with people that you trust and love, I want you to think back to the choices that you are making, small and big. And I want you to do two things. I want you to firstly, I want you to look at the evidences of righteousness. I want you to look at this past week or this past year, and I want you to identify the fruit. Where have you seen the, the beautiful kind of harvest of God? It could be small ways. It could be I never was able to read my Bible and slowly I am finding time to do that. Whatever it is, small, big, it doesn't matter. What, where do you see the evidences of righteousness in your life? And then I want you to look at the kind of three things that, that the, the scriptures say, you know, the walk in the council, stand in the way, sit in the seat. So mind, actions, identity. In those three things, mind, action, identity, where do you see room for reorientation? Where do you feel like the Holy Spirit is inviting you to not partake in? What are the patterns of your thoughts, your actions, your identity, um, gravitational pulls that he is asking you to lay down so that your path, your way is a way of righteousness? And then after that, if you, whether you're on your own or with family or friends um, in this time of isolation, I'm going to ask that you pray. If these are people that you feel comfortable with, maybe you can share some of the things the Holy Spirit is kind of highlighting. Um, but take some time. Pray. What, God, what are the areas that I can step out of to commit to so that we can slowly and diligently become a people who live in a posture, a, trend, a trajectory of righteousness? I'm going to pray for us even now as we head into scripture. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the goodness of that word. And I just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our souls to just honesty, honest conversations around your truth this morning.